Yep. And and they didn't have a lot of money. So for him to get a nice new car is a big deal. But he gives it to her when he knows that she's drinking with her friend. So they take it to a party. And as they're coming back, and no one knows anything about this fucking party. No one knows who's there. They've interviewed friends and they're like, we don't know who, we can't remember anyone who was there. Yeah. It's very odd. So no one knows exactly what that was about. But on their way home, she got in a drunk driving accident. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel and welcome to another true crime video. Man, this one is very highly requested. I feel like I've been just like busting out the highly requested ones lately. I'm just trying to <laughs> catch up on my inbox. But yes, this one has been in there so many times and wow, I can't believe I had never heard of this case. Like never heard of it before I started doing research. And once I read about it and learned about what this case entails i was really shocked and um pretty depressed honestly this story is very upsetting i feel like i should warn you guys in advance it's definitely one that is not for the faint of heart but it is very interesting how this all happened and it's definitely something that should be remembered today we're talking about the powell family from utah and i've had so many people from utah ask me to cover this case because this just really struck that community so i'm going to tell you about the case in a second but before we get started i wanted to thank our sponsor audible you guys know I love Audible. I've talked about it so many times on my channel and I love working with Audible because I'm an Audible customer. I pay for my subscription every month and have for a really long time. I've been using audiobooks forever because I have learning disabilities and I struggle hardcore with reading. So listening to an audiobook is always better for me because I'm able to comprehend the information and enjoy it more. I listen to audiobooks on a wide variety of topics, specifically crime ones I love. I listen to them in the car, on planes, while I shower, while I do the dishes, I listen to them whenever I have a free chance I can just throw it on like while I do my makeup or something and I feel like I'm educating myself and reading while doing other things it makes multitasking really easy today I specifically want to tell you about a book called if I can't have you this book is about Susan Powell and her family and what happened to them it has really great reviews I haven't listened to it myself but I plan to and it's supposed to go even more in depth into this case so if you find that during this video you have more questions because you probably will it might be a good time to check out audible and not to mention they are offering you guys a free 30-day trial when you start your 30-day trial you also get a free audio Audio book. All you have to do is go to audible.com slash Kendall Ray and they will hook you up with that free book. Or if you prefer, you can text Kendall Ray to 500 500 and they will get you started that way. For any of you guys who are in school, I highly recommend Audible. You can use it in so many ways for school. It's insane. I know that's that time of year that a bunch of you just started high school, college. If you have a book on Audible, take advantage. It will make your life so much easier and you will literally understand it better. And they have an unreal selection of books, like tons and tons of books. So there's something for everyone. And if you didn't like your book, you can actually swap it for something else, no questions asked. So again, to start that free trial, you just head over to audible.com slash Kendall Ray. Okay, so let's get into our story today. This is Susan Cox Powell. She was born on October 16th of 1981 in the state of Oregon. She was described as being a really warm and loving person, very friendly, sweet, and a really great mother. People always said that she would do anything for anyone, was very selfless, and very fun to be around. And this is Josh Powell. Josh was born on January 20th of 1976 in Oregon. However, Josh's childhood is a bit disturbing. Stephen, who is his father, was very abusive to Josh when growing up. In court documents from Josh's previous divorce, it described Stephen being abusive to Josh and Josh was suffering emotionally because of it. Apparently, Stephen was showing very inappropriate things, I'm sure you can imagine what they were, to his son at a very young age, which is really disturbing. And his childhood was definitely tumultuous at one point he tried to commit suicide he didn't and then another time he actually took out a butcher knife and tried to attack his mom with it because she asked him to do the dishes so this isn't just like any person we're talking about here he's got a lot of issues but Josh ended up working in web design and real estate and Susan and Josh were actually both Mormons which is a very strict religion as many of you who have experienced it with it know and it's all about commitment and you know marriage being a sacred thing so a lot of them get married really young. They actually met at a church function when Susan was only 19 years old. However, she was confident that her and Josh were meant to be together and they quickly tied the knot and it kind of shocked all her family. It was like very sudden, very fast, and she was really young. In April of 2001, 
They officially tied the knot. And for the first few years, they were actually thought of to be the perfect couple. They were, you know, this young, beautiful couple with their whole life ahead of them, ready to start a family. Eventually they decided to leave Oregon and move to Utah, specifically West Valley City, Utah. And on January 19th of 2005, Susan and Josh had their first son. His name was Charles. And two years later, on January 2nd of 2007, they had their other son, Brayden. Charlie was said to have loved bugs, science, and nature. He also loved to write and wanted to write books one day. Brayden was said to have loved trains and cars, and they said that he also loved Transformers. Their family was thought to be a perfect little close-knit family. However, you soon find out that this was not the case. One of Susan's friends that she had been friends with since she was a child, Susan started to tell her that their relationship wasn't so perfect and there was a lot going on behind the scenes. She claims that Susan told her that Josh was very abusive. She said that Josh owned her and she had to do whatever he wanted her to do. And Darlene also said that whenever Susan would try to talk to Josh about leaving him, he would threaten her and say those boys are his and that's not going to change if she leaves. Basically saying that if she leaves, she won't see her boys. So Darlene said that if all the stuff about Josh's childhood was true, then Susan did a good job of hiding it or possibly didn't even know about it because she never told Darlene and she trusted Darlene with most things. Darlene said apparently at one point Josh also withdrew affection and love from her. Supposedly she even knew the exact date of conception of her son because they never did it. <laughs> and in addition to this abusive relationship that is clearly derailing and very unhealthy, they were also really struggling financially. Now this story is probably gonna remind a lot of you of the very recent Chris Watts case. So yeah, oftentimes when people are having financial problems in their marriage, it, it ends up so much stress, blaming each other, and they end up hating each other. In April of 2007, Josh declared bankruptcy. Another very strange thing is that Susan took this very odd video, I'll play it for you guys, of herself filming her belongings. I guess it's not that weird. Considering what happened to her, it feels weird, but I guess it's kind of smart to do. She basically filmed their whole house so that they had record of what they owned in case there was a flood, a fire, or something like that. Uh, this is me, July 29th, 2008. It is 1233, mountain time. Um, covering all my bases, making sure that if something happens to me or my family or all of us that our assets are documented. Hope everything works out and we're all happy and live happily ever after as much as that's possible. Charlie, say hi. This is Josh's computer, and there's some type of backup device. He built it himself. I think there's like five hard drives, something about doing raids. Josh locked this, but this is all of his files. See, locked. Those are his files. And he bought expensive stuff, like these are, I think this was like a couple of thousand dollars of like, it says graphic design templates by stock layouts or something like that. This is all stuff bought in a year or less through Home Depot on my credit. Josh bought a lot of stuff and then he had to bankrupt it. And then he bought a little bit more on my credit. And I had necklaces too. I don't know where those are. I got in a rage, as you can see, and broke this. There's duds and pearls and opals in there. Broke this and threw all my DVDs and made a mess because he was angry at me about a year or two back. Here's a wedding picture. This remote, I guess, is like $300. <laughs> Speakers, 5.1 surround sound. Be quiet, Charlie. This is a can organizer that Josh is, and I made. I had to help him all through the way. He doesn't do projects by himself. More supplies, little freezer. Josh did have this before me. Table saw. But a lot of people speculate that maybe she was doing it in case something happened with Josh. And in this video, she kind of like dogs on Josh a few times. I mean, nothing like intense, but she's like, oh, he didn't help me with this, or he doesn't do this, or whatever. And she doesn't seem too thrilled with him. So that video is definitely a little eerie to watch. So moving forward in time here to December 6th, 2009. So that morning, Susan and the two boys, Brayden and Charles, who were four and two, went to church. They came back from church 
church. And then later on that day, a neighbor came and visited them. And apparently she left around 5 p.m. However, the next morning, Monday, December 7th, Susan was supposed to drop her boys off at daycare and never showed up. And I can't believe they didn't do this in the Cooper Harris case, it's so odd, but the daycare luckily called Josh's sister. She was their emergency contact and she told her that she never showed up that day. So Jennifer actually went over to their house to check on them. When she got there, she knocked on the door repeatedly and there was no answer. And she actually started getting worried that maybe someone in the family was hurt from carbon monoxide poisoning. She called police and the police actually made the decision to break into the house. And when they got in there, all they found was Susan's purse and her phone, but she wasn't there. None of them were. So why would she leave without her purse and phone? We tried to knock on the door and um, when we couldn't get anybody, we caught the police. And they also found two big box fans pointed at the carpet, like trying to dry it. And she basically described seeing carpet that had just been washed that someone was trying to quickly dry. There were two great big box fans pointed right at the carpet in the living room and it looked like somebody had washed the carpet. Josh claimed that he and his sons had just returned from a spontaneous camping trip that they had left for the previous night. They said that Susan was not with them, so they had no idea where she was. He didn't leave his house until midnight. Now, if you have been camping, I have been camping many times in my life living in Colorado, you do not leave at midnight. Like, that is, especially with two kids. Josh? Hey, I'm Chris Jones from Hawaii. Yeah. How you doing? I know this has been difficult for you. What's um, going through your mind today? Well, I've been trying to figure out what I can do so I don't sit idle. I was just going to go in and get my kids because, you know, they're... How, how, are family. They, how are they doing? Um, they've been doing good. Uh, as far as I can tell. How about you? I mean, I know this is difficult on you. How are you doing? I mean, this is such... It's got to be a lot of uh, emotions going on for you. Um, you know, people have been really helpful and supportive, so... It's been... Uh, it's been really hard, but... You know, you just keep going. What, what can you tell us about that night? I mean, um, from what we understand, you went camping and then came home. Well, tell us what, what happened that night. Yeah, I just, I, a lot of times I just go camping with my boys, you know, not, not anything big. I just go overnight and, you know, we do s'mores and stuff like that. And so I just went with the boys. I was planning to do some s'mores in the morning and, um, and we did. And then when we got home, um, well, on the way home, I found out that people were worried about us and 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 um, the report is is that neither you nor your wife called in sick and they said that that's not usual what what are your thoughts on that um no it's it's not usual i um, i guess why didn't you call in sick you know i i didn't uh I was somehow thinking that it was Sunday. And what time did you go camping, would you say? Um, I, you know, I, I got out to a pretty late start. Nine-ish, something like that. No, it was, it was later. And it is cold this time of year. But he claims that he took the kids to Simpson Springs in West Utah. Police actually visited the campsite later on on December 10th, but found no evidence of any type of crime. Why take your two young sons camping? after midnight, freezing cold temperatures. Well, we just go out and do things that are fun. Now, one of the weirdest things about this case is that it took Josh two days to alert Susan's family that she had gone missing. And they claim that when he did tell them, he didn't seem concerned about her, didn't seem like he was proactive about looking for her, and seemed to have no clue where she went. Like she's basically up and vanished. A West Valley family hasn't heard from her for days. Police found the husband and two kids today. But where is the wife and mom, Susan Powell? You can see there are two different West Valley City forensic unit trucks that just did just pull up on scene. In addition, several different police trucks. 
Neighbors and investigators all saying it. It's strange that he came home with the kids and not her. There's something strange and mysterious. We're not getting the information that we need to determine where she was at, when she left, who she left with, if anybody. But this quickly became a really big case in Utah, and it wasn't long until it was national news. At this point, police had no sort of leads about where Susan was, and Josh at this point was just a person of interest, not an official suspect. There just was no evidence for them to make the move on Josh. Josh, and it was a big mistake. Only a month after Susan went missing, Josh decided to randomly up and move. And this looked really shady to pretty much everyone. I mean, you randomly decide to move a month after your wife goes missing. Like you'd think if your wife was missing, you'd stay put so she could come back to you or you could be around the area to help look. But no, Josh and his boys decided to move to Washington. And all three of them moved in with Steven, Josh's father. And at this point, Josh was still maintaining that he had nothing Nothing to do with Susan's disappearance. So later on in summer of 2010, yes, all of this time has gone by. No one knows where Susan is. They can't do anything about Josh. The boys are at a summer camp. And while they were there, Brayden drew a very disturbing picture. He drew a minivan and he drew himself in it, his brother in it, and his father, but not his mother. And when he was asked where his mother was, he said that she was in the trunk. He then continued to say that he remembers his mom and dad getting out of the car and then only his dad coming back. The older brother, Charlie, also said the same thing. One time he even told his teacher that his mommy was dead. And even after these events happened, the police still did not see a reason for arresting Josh. So people were starting to get really sketched out, the general public just starting to think like, obviously this guy seems like he's involved with it. He's being very sketch. He did interviews that were just weird. So Josh kind of felt the heat on him. And at this point he brought in his father, Steven, to help him. <laughs> First words were like fireworks, John. These two dads, they haven't spoken face to face since their kids moved on to Utah. Now it got even more surreal when Josh Powell showed up to this rally here. He showed up agitated and emotional, but he spoke like never before. <laughs> Thank you. We're just asking the public to remember her. Thank you. A simple roadside rally to keep Susan Powell's disappearance in the spotlight. Well, we were just handing out flyers and all of a sudden he comes approaching with cameras. Instead became a flashpoint between families. I have a restraining order right here. Would you like to read it? Oh, well, no, that's okay. Chuck Cox, the missing woman's father, squared off with Susan Powell's father-in-law at a Fred Meyer parking lot in Puyallup. How okay. is you coming here helping to find Susan? It isn't helping to find Susan. How is your standing at our neighborhood market helping to find Susan, Chuck? People Steve Powell says Cox is spreading misinformation about his son and harassing his family by staging events where they shop and live. I was in your neighborhood the day the, the newspaper were there. I wasn't in your neighborhood uh, at all. Chuck is a liar. Do you have any evidence? The, no, he, he Chuck is lying. Uh, the heated he clash saying. took a turn when Susan's husband, Josh, pulled up and made a teary-eyed claim. Chuck Cox uses my sons as pawns in the media to drive whatever message he is trying to drive. So they decided to make it seem like Susan was mentally ill. But in an interview, Josh also says that Susan could have been cheating on him. They believe it could have been 30-year-old journalist named Stephen Kocher. Stephen disappeared just a few days after Susan. And the problem with this claim is that there's literally no connection to him and Susan, other than the fact that he went missing right before she did. Problem number two is Stephen actually disappeared from Las Vegas, about 400 miles from where Susan was. So this was just a ridiculous claim out of nowhere. And then his dad started to act like the creep of all creeps. He did an interview where he said that Susan was very sexual towards him. Now this is not Josh, this is his father, Steven. She would bend over my lap to let me smell her hair or she would come in and say, I just waxed my legs, uh, feel my thighs, how smooth they are. Seriously, this is the kind of thing that Susan seemed to enjoy doing. And this creep even wrote a song about her and posted it to his website. It's called Secretly. I can love you in a secret way. I can love you each and every day. It's 
so creepy. Susan's friends and family felt like these claims were complete BS. They felt like they were just making it up and he's just some sicko. I mean, he was definitely known for doing some weird things with Josh when he was a kid. They said that Susan was actually very afraid of him. He creeped her out. He would stick his hand up the back of her shirt. And apparently the reason they even moved in the first place to Utah was to get away from Stephen because he creeped her out so much. So investigators started to think that something was weird about Stephen and they decided to search his home and they found a bunch of shit. Police removed at least three computers and four boxes of material from the house. They found 4,500 pictures of Susan that was taken without her knowing, including close-ups of her body parts. On September 22nd, Stephen was arrested for child pornography and voyeurism, which is watching someone without their knowledge. He claimed that he was not guilty. And once investigators found out about this, both of the boys were taken from Josh and put in foster care. Susan's parents immediately tried to file for custody of the kids. They started to get really worried that maybe he would harm the kids that they knew something or they witnessed something while they were on that camping trip and that he would try to get rid of them I love my sons yesterday I had a visit with my sons they ran and played and they repeatedly jumped on my lap in September of 2011 the judge did grant custody to the grandparents we're happy to have them with us. We want it the best for the kids. And the judge said that if he moved out of his dad's house, they could do supervised visits. Josh agreed and he ended up moving to Graham, Washington. And at first he was only allowed to see his kids in a secure facility. However, soon they made the decision to let Josh do in-home supervised visits. So someone's still in the house watching, but it's in your house, not at some facility. Now this ended up being a huge mistake. So this is Elizabeth Hall. She was a caseworker who was assigned to assist the home visitations between the boys and Josh. And Elizabeth said that her and the boys became very close. On February 1st of 2012, Josh actually had a court date scheduled as part of his attempt to get his sons back, get his custody back. However, when he was in court, the judge brought up a completely new discovery. Police discovered really disturbing cartoons that were very sexual. Because these were just drawings and not actual pictures that he took, they couldn't arrest him. However, the judge actually ruled that the boys would remain with their grandparents until Josh received a psychosexual evaluation. And Josh did not take this news well. After he got this news, investigators believe he started concocting a evil plan. Josh went and withdrew $7,000 out of his bank account. I think he then went and bought a ton of gas from the gas station. I think he filled up at least a couple five gallon tanks. He then went to a thrift store and donated all of his son's toys. And then February 5th, 2012, that morning, the boys were actually telling their grandparents how they didn't want to go see their dad. Although caseworkers did say that when they were together, everything seemed great and they seemed really happy to be with him. His grandma reassured him that everything was going to be fine and that his dad had had fun things for them to do and was excited to see him. Elizabeth picked up the boys and drove them 10 minutes from the grandparents' house to Josh's new house. And as they were on their way, Josh actually wrote an email to his family members. All it said was, I'm sorry, goodbye. And then he left a very distraught message for his family. Not able to live without my sons, and I'm not able to go on anymore. I'm sorry to everyone I've hurt. Goodbye. Josh's sister heard the voicemail and got insanely worried and called 911. I think my brother might be in trouble or something. What's going on with your brother? He's, I don't know, he's sending weird emails, he's saying goodbye and stuff. It says that Josh has been in the, the media, right? Yeah. She tried to call her brother several times, but there was no answer. Meanwhile, Elizabeth and the boys pulled up in the driveway, and as soon as they did, the boys jumped out of the car and ran up to the front door. Elizabeth said this is something that they pretty much always did, so she didn't think anything of it, and she started getting out of her car and walking towards the front door. And as she was walking up to the door, he gave her this really weird look, kind of shrugged at her, and slammed the door in her face before she could get inside. So the boys were in, and she was not. Elizabeth started screaming, at Josh to open the door, banging on the door. And then she heard Josh say, Charlie, I have a big surprise for you. And then she heard Brayden start crying out. We found out that at this point, Josh was attacking his sons with a hatchet. Then Elizabeth started to smell gasoline. Hey, I'm on a supervised visitation for a court-ordered visit, and something really weird has happened. The kids went into the house, and the parent, the biological parent, whose name is Josh Powell, will not let me in the door. What should I do? What's the address? 
It's 8119, and I, I think it's 89th. Um, I, I don't know what the address is. It's <laughs> pretty important for me to know. Um, sorry, I can't. Just a minute. Let me get in my car and see if I can, if I can find it. Nothing like this has ever happened before at um, these visitations, so I'm really um, shocked. And I could hear one of the kids crying, but he still wouldn't let me in. Okay, it is, uh, you can't find me by GPS. No. But I think I need help right away. He, he's on a very short lease with CSHS, and CPS has been involved. And this is the craziest thing. He looked right at me and closed the door. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm just waiting to know where you are. Okay. It's 8119 189th Street, Port East, Puyallup, 98375. And I'd like to pull out of the driveway because I smell gasoline and he won't let me in. You want to pull out of the driveway because you smell gasoline, but he won't let I you... I smell... He, he won't let me in. He won't let you out of the driveway? He won't let me in the house. Whose house Some is it? kids in the house and he won't let me in. It's a supervised visit. How did he gain access to the children before you got he there? Gra- they, they, I was one step in back of them. So they he went into the house the and then he locked you out? Yeah. He, okay. he shut the door right in my face. Okay, how long will it be? I don't know, ma'am. They have to respond to emergency, life-threatening situations first. The first available deputy... Well, this, is, this could be life-threatening. He went to court on Wednesday, and he he didn't get his kids back. And this is really... I'm, a, I'm afraid for their lives. Okay, has he threatened the lives of the children previously? I have no idea. All right. We'll have the first available the deputy contact you. Thank you. Bye. And oh my God, it pisses me off how they acted. I mean, I get mad at dispatch calls all the time. A lot of them are really great and are really good at their job, but some of them are just so disrespectful and they did not understand the severity of this emergency at all. But by the time that anyone would get there, it'd be way too late. After several minutes, Elizabeth tried her best to convince them to come. As soon as she got off the phone with them though, she turned around and Josh's house completely exploded. No one survived the explosion other than Elizabeth who was outside. Hello? Hi, ma'am. Were you calling about the fire in the 8200 block? Yes, he exploded the house. Ma'am, yes, do you know the house. Okay, do you know the exact address of the house? Or are yes, you it's, it's 8119 189th Street, Court East, okay. two hours. Okay, stand line. Do you know if anyone's in the house? Yes, there was a man and okay. two children. I just dropped off the children, and he wouldn't let me in the door. Okay, stand line for the fire department, okay? I'm going to get them on the line. Do not hang up. Hold on. I gave them that exact address. I dropped it. Sorry. Just a minute. I can hear the fire trucks, but they're not here yet. It's 8119. There. I mean, this was so terrible. The community was so shook. There are two overwhelming emotions out here this morning. Deep, deep sadness and also anger. Anger that these two little boys couldn't somehow be protected from their father. A man that so many people feared was a killer. The fire and apparent explosion was so powerful it shook neighbors' homes and sent bits of insulation from the house raining down on the neighborhood. All of a sudden, the house shook and I ran outside and you can see this black smoke. This wasn't tragic. This was deeply wrong. This was evil. You do not kill little kids. Police found three bodies in the center of the rubble, two children and an adult. They say there is no doubt that Josh Powell wanted to end his life and take his little boys with him and say an accelerant was used to make the house burn quickly. Friends and family of Susan are starting to think, oh yeah, 100% Josh must have done something to Susan. When Josh's father, Stephen, was notified about the incident, he didn't even seem to care. Susan's family thinks that Stephen probably knows something about this, but he's decided to plead the fifth when it comes to Susan's case. And in 2015, he finally made a statement about the case in court. Josh's sister, Jennifer, the one who came up to the house, fully believes that Josh killed his wife and kids. She said she actually had a feeling that he did something to Susan from like day one. Stephen was actually released from prison on July 11th of 2017. 
He had served a total of seven years and he actually passed away on July 23rd of the following year, 2018. So this last summer, the official death for Josh and the two boys was carbon monoxide poisoning. And in August of 2012, the police actually released more interesting things about Josh. Apparently prior to her disappearance, Josh withdrew his kids from daycare, canceled Susan's regular a chiropractic appointment, got rid of her retirement account and talked to a coworker about how to hide a body. And he specifically talked about getting rid of a body in an abandoned mine shaft in Utah. February 11th of 2012, there was a funeral held for the boys. The reason I didn't make this video into like a where is Susan Powell is because we're pretty sure Susan is not alive. Her family is actually trying to get her legally presumed dead. So before Josh died, he named his brother Michael as the main beneficiary of his life insurance policy. Police had actually questioned his friend Michael several times in 2012. And that's because they discovered that two years after Susan went missing, he got rid of his car in an abandoned junkyard in Oregon. Utah authorities have actually stated that they believe that Josh and Michael worked together in the disappearance of Susan. But on February 11th of 2013, Michael actually took his own life. Soon after that, they closed the investigation, but shortly after that, they found a handwritten will that's assumed to be Susan's, and it said, if I die, it may not be an accident, even if it looks like one. And it instructed the reader to not show her husband. Now there is a lot more about this story in that book, If I Can't Have You. There's a lot about alleged sexual misconduct between Josh and his kids, but we're not sure about it. There's so many questions and not many answers because they're all gone. The book even mentions that Josh possibly could have even starved his kids, not giving them food, and possibly could have even done this to Susan. Turns out the relationship could have been way more abusive than we even thought. Susan's family ended up having to go through a court battle with Josh's family, who was trying to get her estate. They were trying to have her legally announced as dead. But finally, in March 2015, her family got full control of her estate, as it should be. And in December of 2017, they asked the 9th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals to let a jury decide if Washington's Child Welfare Agency is liable for the deaths of their grandchildren, Charlie and Brayden. One of their attorneys argued that the missing wife should have been a red flag and that they never should have allowed the kids into the house, which I completely agree with. They knew that they were talking about their mom being in the back of a truck. Very recently, September 7th, a federal court announced that they were going to wait on the ruling of the lawsuit against Washington State Welfare Services. So at this point, we're still kind of waiting to see what happens with that, but I'm very interested to see if they will hold them responsible. Do you think they should be responsible? Do you think they will be held responsible or there'll be some justice for this? It's hard because, you know, those agencies are trying their best, but oftentimes a lot of these kids end up in such shitty situations that could have been prevented because of mistakes like this. So I'm very curious about your guys' opinions on this. I know this story is so sad. I have like no happy ending. My heart goes out to anyone personally connected to the family in any way. I just cannot imagine going through this. What a terrible, terrible tragedy. But that's it for me today, guys. Definitely let me know your thoughts on the case. Be sure to hit the thumbs up button if you like this video. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any more of my content. Hit the notification bell too. But that's it for me today, guys. Stay safe and I will see you next time.